deep into the fall now as we look at our training calendar and, and obviously excited about Alabama coming in for a long scrimmage Saturday. And that's going to be a really neat event here. Uh, we're going to try some things at Hauser that I think the fans and including the students will really enjoy. And you have a chance to have a team that was actually here in the regional, so they're familiar with this setting. But it's a cool day. It's going to be really, really neat. And we have football opportunities around the facility available, so throughout the course of the day people can watch some of the football events that are going on leading into to our football game that evening. It's fun when we get these opportunities to see our players play against a different team. It does get a little old. Any coach in any sport will tell you, hey, we're ready to see somebody else. Well, we're not at the point where we're ready for the season, but it is enjoyable to have another program roll in here. And we saw that when we went to Pensacola that event for the Wahoos to open up the way they did and for DC Reeves to accommodate us, he's the mayor of Pensacola, for him to really provide in terms of the structure of the event and the day in the city and we had a flyover with the, the Navy Jets. For that event to evolve into what it did was really unique and special and I think the people in Pensacola got to enjoy a Florida State team heading west and, and playing over there. So now you look at the, the Alabama game, the same type of environment will be provided here, and we have the best fans in the country, so this will be a, a snapshot for them to see essentially the majority of our team perform. And when I look at – we'll take a break in between the halves of this just so everybody can regroup and so we can get a new home plate umpire involved. But – we try to get all of our players involved. It's not possible for all of the pitchers to pitch in this, but all of the position players will play. And then we, when we scrimmage, we divide this up into two teams, and we try to make those teams balanced and even. And that's what we'll do this week leading into the Alabama game, and that's what you'll see when we play Alabama. You'll see two halves. I'm not at a point, I, I'm not concerned with depth chart or the first team and the second team. And the, I'm not at all. Like all of these guys have our uniform on, they're all going to go out there and play, just like we do when we scrimmage. So that's my approach to this. And there will be a time when we look more at you know, a starting lineup and a pitching rotation and how we use the guys. But at this point, it's to just continue to gather data and familiarize our staff with what our players look like. And then when you bring in a team of that quality, you get to see what they look like against somebody else. Coming out of the, the last exhibition against Auburn, you're a little disappointed with the performance on the mound. Just how did you see those guys respond in the scrimmages that you had this week? Well, we really had one of our most dominant pitching performances in our scrimmages. And that's really what you like to see. Then I walk out concerned about the offensive side. So to leave happy, <laughs> you want to see the balance of a little bit of both. But I've, I've seen both. I'm not sure I've seen both in one setting and, and honestly I'm not too concerned about that right now. You want to see dynamic stuff on the mound. You really you have to see that if you think you're going to pitch the way we need to pitch. Then you need to see the quality of that bat extend itself like through a, a lineup on one team and then through a lineup on another so that you feel like when you mesh this you have guys that can truly compete against our most dynamic arms. So it's, again, hard to assess until you kind of bunch it all up. But I periodically have seen good, good efficiency on the mound. And I have seen some electric dynamic at-bats. So that's a good combination. Now, when does it blend and morph into one team? Not, not for a long time. So that's the most difficult part of evaluating the scrimmages is there's just so many moving parts and you know you're going to have some ups and downs throughout the course of those long events where everybody's playing. As a, as a coach, how can you tell or do you know when you have great against great pitching versus great hitting as opposed to just maybe good pitching going up against good hitting? Can you identify that? Yeah, those, those tough at-bats are the pitchers really able to get ahead. Now, how do you get ahead against really good hitters? 
above average secondary pitches in, in certain situations might be the way to get ahead of some advanced hitters that seem to be able to handle most fastballs. Then you want to see the hitter show the ability to recognize and take some of those above average secondary pitches, whether they're balls or strike, strikes doesn't really matter as much as the sense of their ability to recognize and, and maybe take some of those. Then you like to see those at bats deepen a little bit. And then you want to see two strike type pitching. Now can guys climb the fastball up where they need to get it? Can they expand away or in? Can they expand secondary pitches down? And again, can the hitters recognize that? And throughout the course of those confrontations, you probably see some tough pitches fouled off. You see some mistakes in various counts that need to be really hit hard. So that's a deep way to look at it. Uh, the mistakes that we make need to be hammered. And the real quality pitches that are made early in the count especially probably are better off being taken. So I think when it's done right and your pitchers have their A game and your hitters are on it, you start to see some really intriguing deep count matchups. Like Soto's home run that he hit the other night was an example of an at-bat that just continued to go and pitchers were executing elite stuff. Some of it in the zone was so dynamic that it was hard to hit and he fouled pitches off. Um, that's the length of the at-bat that you want to see sometimes when you know your pitchers are, are really on it, matching up with hitters that are also recognizing and taking, swinging at good pitches, taking tough ones. And it tends to deepen the count a little bit and lengthen the at-bat. Thinking about some of those transfer pitchers and those, those new guys that we just haven't seen a lot of yet, uh, how are you seeing them battle, attack, uh, maybe trying to put together some clean innings? Yeah, like Bellini, Joey yeah. Bellini has stood out. I think just the feel of you can go play baseball behind him the way he has pitched. He's been in the zone, very consistent, multiple pitches, fields his position. You're going to talk to Evan Crest. He'll be in here in a few minutes. He has shown that. I think Micah is learning them and really what they need to maybe take the next step. Maybe it's shaping of pitches, maybe it's something that's slightly mechanical, maybe it's just the sequencing and those guys understanding how these games are gonna essentially be called when you're pitching against some of the top hitters in college baseball, which is what they do in our scrimmages, but it might not be quite condensed into one, one group yet. So I like it. Prescott has shown some up to 97s, and he's trying to figure out his his secondary pitches. And I may be missing somebody, but but those three have really stood out. Um, Kinnear has had some some moments where it's been good. I think some of these guys that come in, and you have older hitters, more experienced hitters, more physical. I think sometimes they're learning that when I do make a mistake that thing can be hit and hit really hard and really far. So the best lesson for some of those new arms is what we can do when our hitters are on. And again, that's come and gone. It hasn't been as consistent a lesson as I maybe would like to be able to teach through the offensive side, but those guys have stood out and we still have plenty of time. You know, we have this weekend, we have really the full week this week, the weekend, and then you get into the Garnet and Gold game, which is, us against us, but you're you're not limiting the innings and the at bats because there's an Alabama rule and it. it's it's all us. So I think that'll be a good display too for those for those arms to continue to hone their stuff and gather some some more innings. Cam Leiter, he, he tweeted that he had a, a cleanup done. Just I guess from what he had done, do you guys have kind of a, a better sense of, of where he's at in a timeline now, or is it just kind of a wait and see after after what he had? These are tough things, and you guys all know that he tried to rehab his way all the way through it, and we were in the ACC championship game, and he threw a bullpen in Charlotte, and we were hopeful that that would lead him into having the ability to pitch in the postseason, and clearly that didn't play out. Continued to rehab, and I think everybody got to a point where they thought going in to figure out what this was and try to clean it up was the right maneuver. The good news is when they did do the procedure, it wasn't as severe as they thought it might have been. 
So that's really positive. And any athlete that's going through, think about he was rehabbing since essentially April 1st through a couple weeks ago. You have to mentally get over that and sometimes having that minor procedure physically obviously will help you and then mentally it gets you over the hump and can be a really good reset for any athlete and for somebody that's as intense about what they're doing as he is, you know, feeling 100% and knowing that you're, you're good to go and that you're correct. He's not good to go today, but knowing that they saw what they saw, it wasn't that bad and it was cleaned up and ready to go, that's an A-plus outlook. Now, again, now you're back to the rehab timeline, and it's far too early to say where that goes. I can't tell you. Do I expect them to pitch this year? I, I cannot answer that right now. Like, again, like I told you, we almost got to the point where we thought he was going to be available for a regional, a super regional in Omaha, and we didn't get there. So it's hard to be totally accurate, especially when you're fresh off of a procedure. We'll get through the next couple weeks and know more about how the initial mobility and things that they're trying to get him to do in the training room are coming, and then we'll have a better idea. But it's far too early. I'm just glad it wasn't a big deal for him, and it's over with. And I think physically and mentally, he's on a much better runway back to competition. Is it fair to say he's, he wants to play? He's doing everything he can to be available for you guys well, this season? When you are out there and you're throwing that bullpen, when we're about to play the ACC championship game, he's done everything he can do to get back. It just wasn't right. Now, he threw that bullpen, and Mike and I were thinking that this was on the right track, and then he had to throw one more, and it didn't go as well. So he's doing everything he can do. This is, this is not easy stuff. And when you're talking about an arm of that caliber, you want to be – precise and cautious with everything that you do. And we were with the rehab, we were before we made a decision and the medical team made a decision to go through with the procedure and now you have to be equally as prudent with what you do with the buildup. Ben was, ben was another arm that, that had dealt with some injuries last year. I think you were able to get him back on the mound this week. Just how big would it be to get him back to where he was at the start of last season? If he can do what he did yesterday on the mound, It'll help us. That was probably the most pleasant surprise I've had this fall. I mean, he was up to five, and then he touched some fives, which we haven't seen that out of him a lot. But when Phil takes his guys in there, and this is not just because of an injury, but if you go look in that training room throughout the course of the morning, the pitchers doing their arm care and their strengthening programs, it's a lot of work. So, again, when he goes back out there, he was probably better yesterday than I've seen him. Now, it was an inning, but it was really electric for that one inning. Now, again, we have to get over that hump and feel comfortable today and tomorrow to get him back on the mound, but boy, yesterday was a step in the right direction. I'm going to ask you this every year, Coach. Any closer to synchronizing a spring football game and a, a regular season game for you guys? I am so far deep into the schedule, I can't even tell you looking – I don't think it's happening this year. Is it? You got to help me. No, I don't, I don't know. I don't, I, 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 I don't think they've announced it yet. I guess that's part of the problem, right? Like you're getting your schedule set right now, and they don't have a, a firm date of when they're going to have their spring football game. That's probably the easiest way to explain it. Because to everybody at home, it's like, why don't they do this all the time? Why can't the they ACC do it hands us our schedule, and you can make certain requests, but meshing the timing of when we're making a request to the ACC for when we want our bye. We like to play the games on the, on the front end, the series on the front end, versus stopping later in the year, in the middle of the year, to do a non-ACC series. So you're looking at a lot of things, and honestly, I'm working on the 2028 schedule. I'm trying to, I'm trying to stay ahead of this. It's not, it's not easy. And my staff helps me with everything that we do in the program. I try to handle the schedule because I just think it's easier if I handle that. Um, so when we make requests, that's a difficult request to make as far out as we are in playing the schedule. So I know it would be great for the fans, and, and it is something I probably need to do a better job of looking into. I have tried to line that up, and it just wasn't possible with what football was trying to do and with what we were fighting for on our side of it. And, and, and it's more of a timing issue 
than anything else. But I will, I will look at that because I know that would be a really cool event for our fans to come from the football stadium and bebop right over here or vice versa, however you wanted to try to line it up. I know that would be a good thing. It is, it's not as easy to pull off as we would like. Carnes, I think he's, he's really known for his bat, but behind the plate since he's got here, how have you seen that develop? And, and Jackson helping out the new guys, how much of a, a coach on the field has he been behind the plate? He's great. And he's, to help, you have to be talkative. And you guys all know he's talkative. So, that dynamic for him and that leadership capability of just the verbal communication of helping lead those guys. Uh, and Nate's older, and Carnes is a freshman. Carnes pretty advanced. Like his catching is probably further along. When I watched the video of him in the recruiting process uh, and our coaches that got to see him play, you don't get to see everybody play a bunch of games, but you get to see enough. He's done a great job, and Brad works with those guys, and he does extra work, and he is really very deliberate and sincere about wanting to be a good catcher. And he is athletic. He can really, really run. He can really run. So it's not your prototypical catcher. Like this is a very athletic person that could really go play the outfield if you wanted him to. Um, but his catching and throwing has been better than I thought. And when you look at the 194s and the 195s, and it's consistent. It's not a flash in the pan 195. He does a really nice job turning that thing around. And the bat is as advertised. This is the most advanced freshman bat I've seen. Now how that factors in, and clearly when you have Jackson and Nate and Hunter back there, you, you have some some depth and some experience, two older guys. So you like the way this, this lines up and Jackson being a left-handed bat, and you're clearly you have two righties and a, a lefty in play right now. That's really positive and it should give guys time to rest. And you do have the DH spot, which you've heard me enough. I don't really look at the DH spot until I have to. I'm not here trying to coach DHs. We're trying to develop guys to play positions at a high level. And then when you make the lineup out, clearly you have that bonus to stick your DH in there. So Hunter has been really good. Jackson has been energetic as usual and leading and talkative and helpful. 